another episode of the Best Book Club. I'm your host, Nufatora, and this is the podcast where I discuss the best stories with the best minds in the community. On this episode, I'll be discussing Wedgie Noir by Sleep All Today. With me, I have Hans Gutherson. Thank you for joining me. So glad to be back. Thank you for having me on, my friend. Absolutely. I always love hearing your insights on these stories and topics and all, everything. So this was first posted on March 4th, 2020 on DeviantArt, and it collectively has over 44,000 views on its six chapters, parts, however you label it. Um, And it basically is about a not-so-hard-boiled detective attempting to make sense of a case with seemingly no true leads in as far removed away from something like the usual suspects as possible. No. Yeah, I think that's a, a very nice sum up. It is yeah. such a more humorous take, you know, on detective stories. And it's not really noir as much as it is a sort of like very comedic whodunit mm-hmm. in some ways. But a great formula for mixing, you know, a mystery with a lot of comedy um, that has a lot of tropes you would expect of like, you know, you're in a closed location and there's a certain number of suspects and they mm-hmm. must be in that location and no yep. one could have gotten it you know the agatha christie tropes um yep. that are used to great effect here with mm-hmm. a lot more humor and uh some uh, not a ton of wedgies but some that are you know mentioned which was clever right. and a lot of discussion around them uh the whole thing is is a study in aftermath which i think is really cool and works really well as a who done it when you're investigating what happened it's a great great excuse to look at what comes after a wedgie you know yeah for sure uh, that's actually something that kind of sets the story apart from so many others is like most of the action is sort of being described rather than mm-hmm. experienced um and it's yes. one of the only it's the only really the only detective story i can think of in the community there might be others but i'm not aware i don't know of any others yeah there's certainly some very notable examples i mean sleep all of today did two uh interactive games where you played a detective trying to solve uh wedgie mysteries and those were very cool video games that you did uh the sequel of which was quite predictable but um was still very fun to kind of you got to interrogate people in the mall and figure out some like surprise twists and stuff so a lot of great hallmarks of it and then of course you know like i wrote uh, Lure of the Night, which is like a mm-hmm. recent example. But yeah, that's There's true. been a few. I mean, Cecita had one, right? Cases of, of what was it? Underwear Stretching and Stretch? Undies. Stretch yeah. and Undies, you know? Yeah, so that was right, the very beginnings right. of one. Very beginnings of one. That has a very similar setup to what Sleep All of Today does, you know? It's probably a case of somewhere, someone close to the victim, in the house, limited pool of suspects, you know? um very agatha christie very like uh colonial house up in a s- isolated spot who did yep. it we have to find it out and there's probably going to be some red herrings you know as there is in wedgie noir you know and there's probably going to be some big twist reveal and it might be the butler because the butler always did it uh that sort of thing you know mm-hmm. so there's a few cool examples but Like so many genres in the community, when we talk about them, it's pretty clear that there's not a lot of examples of them. uh, And there's certainly, in my mind, always room for many more of them. Absolutely. It's it's a very underdone genre in this community. Mm -hmm. And I I mean, I guess in that sense, in some ways, potentially it could be a good thing then, because then the, the few that we do have stick out all the more or all the more notable yeah, because certainly of it. true certainly fair point yeah now i i felt the introduction to the criminal through valerie was a little weak it, it, just saying there is a criminal here rather <laughs> than even saying something happened or showing a crime happening reads a little bit like a cop out to me hmm and I think it's it's a bit odd to start the story with Valerie already having information, yet we have no idea where it came from. It, it seems more like a video game where you just have clues from the police commissioner or something. Mm. It's like you're just giving yeah. them right away. There's not really a whole lot of context behind it. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even the way the story starts, you know, you don't really know what you're in for. When we hear, like, a blizzard came in and we're getting a lot of background around this location and things. And, and Valerie coming in and you're not entirely sure who she is or why she's there. And all of a sudden, yes, she certainly does have uh, some deep insight and also some pretty uh deep theories into why it happened you know mm -hmm. without having talked to anybody yeah. and i mean probably detective 101 is you probably don't want to make vast assumptions like that um before talking to literally anyone or knowing <laughs> anything but as as you know as we'll probably get into the fun thing about val is she's not the best detective i wouldn't call her like no a super stellar investigator who is great in interviews or, you know, manages to get everything she can from people, it seems. Um, she's kind of muddling her way through, which is kind of entertaining to see, you know. It adds this level of comedy where she's not, like, a super detective, you know, which mm -hmm. is often a trope we see, you know. People love that. Uh, she's a bit more real, but maybe a little... A little too shoddily as an operator, if that makes sense, you know. Yeah. But certainly, yeah, there's there's a lot of ways you can set up a story like this. And we do get her knowing a lot. We're speeding through things. And certainly there's a case of, like, you could start it. She's a detective in the office, you know. And uh, she's getting assigned the case. And she has to get out here to the place. And uh, you can get, you can go that deep into it, you know, or maybe if she arrives on the scene, it's still video game esque. I totally see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Cause there was a cool video game called like detective grimoire, which is like a flash yes. game. And you start there and you literally start, uh, at the carnival in the first one. And there's like a guy who tells you everything. And if you ask questions, they treat you kind of dumb. Cause they're like, why don't you know this stuff? Look at your notes, which is a very funny way to do it too. But Certainly, yeah, it plays out a lot like a video game, which is kind of fun. And, and the whole story's got a bit of that video game feel, you know, going around suspect to suspect, you know. And I mean, I also liken it to like series like Bones or something where it's kind of the gimmick is always there's three very convenient suspects who they talk to and they all have a potential motive <laughs> and you got to talk to all three of them. And then there's some reveal twist and that, that reveals, you know, the formula is always sort of the same. And you, and you wonder in this story, cause you know, it's unfinished and it leaves off after we've talked to a number of suspects and gone different theories and things, where would it go? Like, who could it be? Um, and so we're left to kind of wonder that unfortunately in some ways. Yeah, it is really unfortunate, but I mean, what can you do? It's uh, yeah, exactly. that's kind of the name of the game in the community is unfinished it's stories. <laughs> it's true. Yes. Yeah. Um, it it kind of, I guess it, it kind of makes me think of like she's emulating Sherlock Holmes, but she has none of the deductive capabilities of Holmes. <laughs> she's that's like good. That's putting random twist. things together that probably don't actually have any connection. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Like, she makes this leap, you know, political motivation. It's it's like, what a crazy motivation. You don't give someone a wedgie. But in the, yeah. you know, world of, of edging, I mean, wedgies are the currency with which, right. you know, everything sort of happens. But still, she jumps to that and knows things like her term's ending and she's running for re-election. I mean, that could have been fun stuff for her to learn, you know, yeah, in absolutely. some way. Maybe she really doesn't know any of this, you know, like... Uh, it's worth, you know, mentioning when we talk about noirs, the, one of the biggest stereotypes is the very, like, hard-boiled detective. And as you point mm -hmm. out, she is not that, you know, and hard-boiled detectives. So when, you know, who cynical, drinks a lot, they're not super, you know, they don't have a lot of care and they're they're not very invested in what's going on. They're sort of looking out for themselves. And, you know, they've seen it all and they're kind of tired. Um, and Val's not any of those things, you know, yeah. she's just kind of there and she's kind of optimistic and happy and everything that's going on. It doesn't it, like, she's, she's more phased by it than like a, than like a hard boiled detective is. She's, she's not also like trying laying hands on people or trying to beat them for information. Like she plays it really straight and innocent, you know? Um, and so like we get that very lighthearted approach to mm -hmm. a detective story. And she plays that all the way through. And it's and tonally it works. And it doesn't shift 
where it's ever like it gets super dark or something, you know, even if they're sometimes dealing with kind of crazy motives that people have and it's like revenge maybe or is it political and uh, it's still very light, it's still very, very friendly and happy, go lucky, you know, the whole time, which is, I imagine what you kind of expect, uh, like from, you know, Sleep All of Today or, or a story like this, it would be kind of different in the community, especially from like a Sleep All of Today, to see something very dark and very heavy, <laughs> um, when especially when you, you know, you started and the case is all about someone got a really extreme wedgie, and now you're trying to figure out who did it. Like yeah. the stakes aren't super high. That's the thing. Right. Um, and and sleep off today. You know he plays into that. He doesn't mistake it for a case of like, oh no, we gotta figure out who it is. My life's in danger or something. It's like no, it's a figure out gave you the wedge. You know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess in that sense, then it sort of is a perfect blend of this community, our ideals and our wants or desires and all that, um, and detective fiction. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, Sleep All of Today is a great understanding of what the community wants. It's how he's, you know, been so popular for so many years and written great, great popular works. Um, and so we definitely see that here. You know, it's the lighthearted approach of the Edge and Universe. Um, and I mean, he's done some other investigative stories before in the past, uh, like Becky, the school counselor. I think was him and it was all about her trying to solve like who started a food fight and there were some wedgies in that you know and uh so there's been small attempts to sort of try it and they're always very lighthearted and very fun and it really is like if you were uh in someone who stumbled onto one of these cases and you get to talk to people all about wedgies <laughs> And you get to find all the details and why people in the past probably got them, you know, and all this stuff. It's all, it's all like references and mentions of wedgies. We never really see one happening yeah. in uh, real time, which is, again, a very cool approach and a very interesting and unique sort of tactic for, you know, telling a wedgie story to put everything in the past, you know. And it kind of works with noirs, which are kind of, you know, interested in, in what came before and consequences and futility more than anything else, you know. Um, but certainly, yeah, he's tapping into what he knows about the community, the fact that lighthearted, you know, cartoony stories are massively popular and just plays into that. We get to see the appearances of well-known characters from the Edge and Universe and get to see them being themselves and getting stuck in the middle of this mystery, you know, it's pretty wild. Yeah, I, I mean, when you look at like how, like, it, I would, I would wager that the vast majority of stories in this community are third person past tense. This is sort mm. of taking that to the extreme, where basically everything is in the past. Everything has already happened, and we're just kind of going it's through true. it afterward. Yeah. yeah. Definitely, definitely. I, I love Sleep's use of the notes, especially when Valerie asks Harriet for her underwear as evidence. I, I think they really give a great <laughs> look at her yes. thought process and help readers understand her that much better. Mm. Yeah, and it's great, you know, when you can blend the actual detective work with a wedgie story. And I mean, that's one for of the sure. best examples of it. When she takes her time, you know, making all those notes about the underwear, like incredibly detailed notes. Uh, that's one of the best parts of the story. Mm -hmm. Like we can, you can take those tropes and wedgify them, you know, in the best possible way. It's easy to just be like, oh yeah, someone got a wedgie and, and we got to talk to people. But things like, yeah, when I'm gathering the evidence, how do I turn that into something that's a wedgie? How do I turn the interviews into something do wedgies? You know, all the way down from top to bottom. The more you can do that, the more it can feel, you know, integrated and like something that's routine and, and part of the world. That's world building. That's really effective storytelling all the way. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Harriet's underwear is Tug's brand. And I've seen that name all over the place for years. Do you know where it came from? Like, I have no idea what the origin of it is. Yeah, it was a creator named Jesse Four, who's a very popular artist now. 
made the brand for a number of stories and art pieces and a bunch of us in the community including myself picked it up including writing a collection of short stories featuring the brand and the crazy people who worked at this insane company <laughs> um including magni poles and myself jesse four and uh jack uh Ari jack i believe were some of the few who did there's a da group dedicated to tugs just somewhat inactive but it does exist and you can find some stories there and art there and stuff but it's all thanks to jesse four very talented artist in her own right definitely okay okay well yeah that's uh i think that's a case of the brand i guess that's a kind of a, a double entendre there um but that, i think it's a case of the sort of the brand or the ip of the creator uh having a much larger reach than the actual creator of the thing yeah she's definitely grown a lot more with her art recently and and gained a very large audience at the time okay. when she made that she was certainly much smaller now she's one of the bigger artists in the community mm -hmm. by far definitely okay. well, that's cool to see that she's still around Sounds yeah bad. no definitely I think she had a period of some inactivity. Now she's got yeah over four thousand watchers on DeviantArt. Wow, one of the biggest creators on there. And I knew her when she yeah. was so tiny. Yeah, she's grown as an artist immensely. I mean, if you look at the early work, and she was sending me sketches for many years and things. And now she's doing a ton of art, a lot of commissions. Uh, I think she's active on Discord and such too. So yeah, it's uh it's very cool to look back on those early origins. You can find our collection of tug stories. You can read them all to see early versions of us writers. Yeah, it's there I yeah, I remember seeing the, the Tugs collection on Lucky Fetish. Never went mm. through it. Although maybe I did, I just don't remember. I don't know. Too many stories that I've read. <laughs> uh I only ever remember reading the first part of Wedgie Noir. So it was really nice to go through a story completely fresh since that doesn't happen too often anymore. Even I mean, even if it is a new story, air quotes, it can read the same as what came before. And this is very different from what from most of what exists, as we've kind of outlined. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And slight correction what I was saying earlier, too, when I mentioned Sleep Off Today, writing Becky, the school detective. It's actually a Sasita story that he wrote uh, long before we see Becky uh, appear in Wedgie Noir, I believe. And uh, and uh, before we get, you know, Sleep Off Today, writes a very detailed story all about Becky many years later. It gets a very long series. But uh, yeah, she does appear in in Wedgie Noir, but uh, we see her kind of earlier in a sleep all of to. I mean, it's to see the story, sorry, called Becky the School Detective, where she gets to be a detective and talk to people. But yeah, no, when we look at you know exactly what you were saying, it does stand out a story in a lot of cool ways. And when you look back at it, you know, several years later, as we do, and we read it. You see, like, wow, it really is interesting and funny and different. And when you're reading it in the moment, you know, and even when you're looking back at it and you're trying to remember what happened and thinking, how many parts are there again? You get hooked into the mystery right away. It's not mm -hmm. hard to get right back into it and get invested in it and wondering who it is. And if you're intense like me, sometimes you might even make a few notes and try to find <laughs> key pieces of evidence and be like, oh, yeah, it's... it's probably not the underwear so who are the suspects it's probably not this one because that'd be too obvious and, and you can go really deep in some of that you know um so yeah no it's it's a very cool story to talk about and uh certainly one you know that hasn't gotten a lot of attention in recent years so it's nice to get to chat about it absolutely and i mean it's it was something that i was like a good segue for this next one but i, I don't remember but right, the length really, like I, I that's mm. that's what it was. Um, like the length, I think, of each piece sort of feeds into the being able to just kind of jump right back into it without really skipping a beat. Mm -hmm. Um, it it drives home the feeling of a sort of five minute mystery. 
right? Just a yeah. fun little thing to keep you hooked for a little bit, but not super long. And I, I don't know if these ever existed, but I think like a newspaper mystery is the most akin to this, or maybe like a a, a book of short stories, like short mysteries. Um, you know, one that doesn't really take much investment at all, and only takes a few minutes to go through, but is super enjoyable all the same. Absolutely, yeah, or the brain teasers, you know, those riddles where it's like short one paragraphs, but somewhere in that short one paragraph is a hint about the truth, and it'll be some random detail about the person died, and it was because the house was red in the roof or something. There's always something so bizarre and little like that. It's like, oh, yeah, because he was red, and from something in the description, it was clear he was colorblind. That's how he died. And it's like something so, like, I would never get those. I could never figure those out because they took, like, some immense amount of, you know, deductive reasoning and crazy just tricking you, you know. But that's a great example of that, too, you know, those very short very brief kind of snippets and it's so episodic wedgie noir you know and it moves along really well where it's just like and here's the next suspect and here's the next suspect but he keeps every interview very different the characters are all very interesting and the way they approach you know talking to val and the way they sort of fit into the narrative it's all fresh so it's not like oh why am i reading another chapter of this you're you're kind of eager to get to the next one when you're reading it to see okay what about the next suspect? Who's it going to be? It really does feel cinematic in that way. And I could see it playing out in a movie or a video game, certainly. And you're talking to the suspects and trying to figure out the, the truth there. So I think it's a really great approach and a great model to follow. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it, like, it, it would really not be too much effort to just write a collection of a couple of stories for in this in the genre because Mm -hmm. especially if you're going with a a short shorter length you kind of i feel like you could sort of find a formula that works for it and then just deviate up a little bit uh like you just have like the one big twist um and you have the couple of clues um just, yeah. I guess trying it to capture seems easy. Yeah. It seems yeah. easy, but it's very, very difficult, as as you know, right? Like as any rating is, but then when you're trying to surprise people, yes. And you're trying to and you know how hard that can be generally. So when we talk about yeah, you gotta figure out first off what's the reveal. And generally you don't want it to be too predictable, right? Like, you don't right. want it to be, oh, it was the butler all along. So you got to figure out what's a creative kind of reveal. And some of the most creative ones I can think of have been written already uh, by the <laughs> likes of, like, Agatha Christie, you know. And whatever Sleep All of Today had planned, you know, would have eliminated one we could kind of lean back on. Um, right. And what a reveal could have been. So, uh, but then, then as soon as you figure that out, you go, okay, I'm going to have this big twist reveal, which takes a lot of planning in itself. Uh, you got to figure out what clues you can leave. And depending how, you know, realistic you want to get with it, it's like, why is this clue here? Why is that something that somebody picks up and how they realize it, you know? And I've mm-hmm. been, I've loved mysteries. I've always loved mysteries. I think it's one of the coolest genres. Always been addicted to them. As you can probably tell by my references to Agatha Christie. And uh, I do like Sherlock Holmes, read some of those stories. Loved a lot of mystery movies. Um, so I've tried to do it and I've started a couple mystery stories, but generally they taper out because they are a lot of work. Even if I feel like I have a really creative twist and reveal and I got that figured out, it's a lot of work to write the clues and figure out how to, especially now when I'm thinking about, you know, being more realistic, I had an idea of like, um, um, a writer, a guy who like kind of spent his career in the community stealing his wife's work she was a really great wedgie writer he just stole his work she's they're old now and she's like i'm gonna reveal to the community it was all me and the guy's like no i'm gonna lose all my fame and you know in this world uh he's quite famous and he gets a lot of money um and he doesn't want to lose that so he kills her and i had kind of elaborate stuff and there was going to be stuff around the underwear was going to be stretched out and there was going to be a detective who figures it out and uh, all this stuff. And it was just so much work to figure out how do you, you know, what's a good 
like method of taking somebody out like killing them how do you get away with it but then how do you like leave the clues so someone can like reverse engineer it you know um i was very i was very much taking like a colombo approach with that one where you know who it is who did it right off the bat but then the trouble with that of course is like so i need to leave some mistakes for the killer like in the detective or whoever it was probably gonna be like a nosy neighbor they have to you know discover these things and figure it out and slowly get to the point where they realize what happened because of the kind of mistakes this guy made they didn't even realize you know um and that's so hard i'm not smart enough for that stuff <laughs> um and especially if you want to do a short as you noted i mean that's a lot to try and pack in like that's true to do clues and to have you know some investment you got kind of care too about the characters and the mystery and if you're doing that in like a one-off 1000 word story or whatever that to me seems like a monumental kind of task um to try and do i could kind of see an approach maybe if you have a bunch of case files or something and someone's going through them and there's some like clue in there or something something like that yeah you know? but I, yeah. that would be a very different format and would be kind of interesting yeah, so I, it's hard it's hard but i'm i love mysteries and i i think it's like sleep off today is doing a great approach here and he's giving it the time you know it deserves he's going through the suspects you know but uh it's it's something i i want to see more people try because then i'll get the confidence to try it myself and actually write something and finish it <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah, it, it, I guess maybe the hardest thing that maybe the hardest thing is is keeping people guessing as to what who yeah. it is and like what it's going to happen. For sure. That's that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing, you know, yeah. like in no other genre do you have to do that or right. keep guessing. I mean, when there's a mystery, yeah. if people know early on, it's not going to be the same. Right? right. They'll probably still read it. But I mean, you want to surprise them. You exactly. really want to get them, so yeah, that's not easy for sure. Yeah, um, I I think doing it in the way that Sleep did probably does make it a little bit easier because these aren't brand new characters; they're already established. They have backstories and plenty of other material, reference material to work off of. So, like, you don't really have to establish who these people are. You can kind of just get into it. Um, now, for someone like myself who hasn't really gone super far into the Edge and universe and is super knowledgeable about all these characters, it's, I'm, I am figuring them out for the first time. But mm -hmm. um, uh, it did feel like these were perhaps not the most realistic of characters, like, but they felt very established. They felt like they had already existed um mm -hmm. and i mean that's it's it, that's i guess that's one of the benefits of having consistent characters yeah that's the thing with edging you know unless you're writing someone who's i don't know getting retconned or someone who's writing them as if you've never read about them before at any point in the universe now, any story you hop into, you're it's almost like jumping into a show, you know, midway yeah. through. And these characters have been around, and people know them, and the writers know them really well. And I mean, years before we get Wedgie Noir, you know, like I mentioned, Becky heads her own multiple part series, Becky's Crusade. And I mean, Diane Swan from the CEO of Outsun. She's been in numerous, numerous stories. So we yeah. have some frame of reference for what she's like and how she acts, even if it is somewhat one notey where she's just the domineering boss who punishes her underlings relentlessly, you know. Um, so we see that. We get a lot of them, you know. And some we probably don't know as much. You maybe see them because they don't have as many stories, but some of them, you know, they have many stories behind them. Other writers have written them. Um so certainly when you're jumping into something like this, it, it reads like an homage in some ways, right? Uh, Wedgie Noir, much like things like um, uh, Haley the Bully, uh, when you get a lot of Easter egg characters, or even Camp Noname in the later parts, when a bunch of characters pop in, uh, and they're not going to get developed or anything, but maybe you get a really nice moment with a character you recognize, who says something or does something cool and 
and that's a sort of fun thing. And I mean, Edgin is one of the most sort of collaborative efforts the community has. This giant shared universe of dozens of characters, you know, that have gone on for more than a decade, I would estimate, um, across stories that spanned art, you know, uh, shared commissions. Like, it's it's very insane, the scope of it. Uh, and so, like, we see an example here, Wedgie Noir, of, like, a really fun experiment of bringing some of these characters together, of bringing them into an almost different genre, you know, um, which is a very fun experiment, too. And, I mean, Sleep All of Today is one of the best at kind of experimenting with the format of the world, you know, because he did Survive the Day, which is a very well-known interactive story, one of the biggest and longest and most art-filled in the community. Um, which had a ton of these characters, you know. Um, so certainly, yeah, when we look at like Wedgie Noir, it's definitely fair to look at it as like this fun homage to Edgin and all the many characters that inhabit it and getting to see them interact, you know, if someone was doing this kind of Wedgie investigation. Right. Um, and it feels like a cool setup, you know. Val could always be a recurring character. I doubt there's going to be any shortage of Wedgie mystery she could have solved potentially right and she could be recurring and have this fun series where she talks to everybody in edge at some point you know and ask mm -hmm. sam Rodra, why is her butt so big you know and gets all those like <laughs> egg jokes that like are so common that even people who don't really know edge and like they get the jokes right like you get what i say when yep. i joke about that because it's mm -hmm. iconic you know yeah i mean stuff like that, so there's i mean there are some characters like like sandra and carol mm -hmm. with like characters like that that sort of even like I said like before the the brand sort of has a bigger reach than the creator those so, those characters sort of uh it, what's oh, i had the phrase in my head and i forgot what it was um they sort of even surpass the brand uh, like they're just so recognizable and iconic in the community like these are yeah certainly characters that basically everyone knows because they've they, everybody has done them every like everybody's yeah. had, had their take on these couple of characters that yeah they're kind of like the they, they've they i guess the community wedgie girls in a sense like that's yeah that's sort certainly of the, yeah the, that's one way to group them it is a very great way to group them, yeah. I mean, even when I, very late into the game, entered Edgin with Mia, um, it was like the first real effort that was kind of accepted. It was accepted very quickly and very happily by members of the community, and now she even is in a relationship with another character. And I should come back to Mia because she's popular and a lot of people like her, and I haven't done anything with her in years, and I feel bad because she's in this relationship and she should probably, like, talk to more characters and stuff. And I guess she could. I have my in now in the Edgen universe. Um, which is fun to think about. But, so that, all that to say, I mean, it's one of the very welcoming spaces, you know. Despite having an insane number of characters spanning, you know, a decade of canon, so to speak. Uh, it wasn't hard for me to create a character and write her in some stories and the next thing i know people are you know commissioning art with her in it and images of her appearing and things so very quickly edgen has this life of its own you know so like a wedgie noir is not unexpected in that world where it's like yeah anybody can work with these characters you can put them in all these fun settings and just see where we can bring it as a community and what we all think of it you know we share our thoughts and fun to see our characters there and uh it's this it's a kind of crazy magical thing you know mm -hmm. absolutely yeah yeah i i love your comparison to a tv show this mm. this story definitely reads like a six episode series to me yeah for I sure this this would be if we had the resources and the people to do it uh, i feel like this would be so easy to adapt to a visual medium i think so i'm optimistic though i think every wedgie story could be a wedgie <laughs> movie but that would be crazy i mean but certainly i could see it you know you start isolated place you could do a low budget 
uh, Wedgie Noir, you know. Small budget, mostly just her going to different rooms and talking to people one-on-one, you know. Don't even have to have really any wedgies just talking about them. I mean, it's mm-hmm. pretty wild. Um, it does. It is one that certainly lends itself really well to adaptation, and plus the fact it's a mystery, a fact that you can you know surprise your audience. I mean, wedgie videos don't do that, as you know. Right. Like there's no wedgie mystery videos. Um, no. we get some weird dream sequence ones, and we get like that's as unusual and as atypical as they get. You know. Yeah. Not really um, much in the way of plot. Exactly. Exactly right, you know. Um, sometimes there's so minimal plot, you're like, you want some. You're kind of craving that. You're like, you want a little story, a little character, you know, um, if you're like me. So, yeah, something like that would be a very fun adaptation. Definitely. would love that. Yeah, and more and more, I'm seeing all these stories, like, they would translate extremely well to manga as well. Mm, sure. The, the first one that sort of made me think of that was... AP's friend sessions, but so many of these, especially like these sort of serialized stories that are very lighthearted and don't take much investment to get into, that'd be mm-hmm. perfect for like a shonen magazine or uh, like a gag comedy sort of thing. Absolutely. No, I agree. 100%. Yeah. Now, as far as I could find, there's just the six parts available and there's no ending which leaves it completely wide open for speculation. So who do you think did it? And what was their actual motive behind the cr- the crime? If it's even a crime, really, in Edgen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she turns out she did it. Like, they find who did it, and they're just like, okay, on to the next case. Yeah. What are we going to do about it? You know, if I arrest you, I have to arrest literally 99% of the population of Edgen. <laughs> really? Now. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I was hooked when I was reading it and when I'm rereading it, you know, so, like t- t- four or three years later, you know, looking back and, um, I think, uh, the one I was sort of leaning on to is it's Harriet. She did it to herself is my fun kind of theory of, of who it was. Can you elaborate on that? Cause I'm not quite sure I, I understand why you would think that way. <laughs> I think first off it's unexpected and surprising yeah. you know it's not someone you'd expect so that's the kind of twist that would get you and then there's a couple reasons i mean we know from the very beginning there's this political backstory going on you know so in my mind if this story gets out she'll get this bump in the elections she'll get the sympathy vote you know, mm-hmm. she used to be a bully, and now she's one of the normies who gets wedgies, you know? Um, so she can be, like, one of the people, and, and please vote for me, look what happened to me, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> Plus, she's wearing Tug's underwear. So to me, yeah. that's a kind of critical piece of underwear. It's designed for stretching. Anybody who wears them knows that. Um, it's in their motto, pretty much. And uh, they're pretty much made for wedgies. So she probably planned this. She wasn't wearing, like, a thong or something. You know, so in my mind, she's a likely candidate. I like her for it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think if if sleep had continued with the story, or if they decide to in the future, um, you probably have to add some more clues to give her a sort of um, weight as a, as a suspect. Because given what we have, it it's I I could potentially maybe see it because it, it doesn't go for super long. None of the suspects get super. Uh, none of the, like they're, they're not, there's not like super amount of clues for all of them. But I I want I feel like Harriet would probably take the most work to legitimately. I guess feel like the, the an earned vic, uh, suspect as opposed to just she's there so she's suspected um or like it's so it's not just done for a cheap twist and it's like, yeah like ah oh, like, oh, re- is that really how you're gonna do it like it would <laughs> and it might be as comedic as it is you know there might be some crazy cheap twist coming yeah you know, keeping in that humor and we might feel ripped off you know as audiences but maybe we're kind of entertained that oh it was really 
uh, she tripped and fell and ended up in a wedgie or something like really stupid, you know, that we would never expect. <laughs> like it could be something not ridiculous. Right. <laughs> yeah, I guess in a in a world like Edgen, that's entirely possible. Exactly. Yeah. Given what we know and what we have about the case, I think the culprit is Becky. Her situation okay. is just too convenient. And while she is the most obvious in my eyes, the most obvious choice seems to be a not too uncommon occurrence in detective fiction, where the writer mm. sort of makes it apparent it'll be the one person almost right away, but then sends you all these red herrings to throw you off the trail. Sure. Yeah, she's got one of the purest motives there is for revenge, you know, mm -hmm. and just push to the brink. She sees this chance to get back at her. It's, it works. It, it could be at her, absolutely. Yeah, but that's the thing with, uh, I guess, detective fiction in general, but also the nature of unfinished stories is that it it could be, it very well could be any of could them. Be. Could be any of them, yep. Could be Val herself, you know. She got bored, needed a case, gave a wedgie. Now she gets to investigate it, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I guess it... <sighs> I mean, I, I guess just as a small side thing, red herring is one of my favorite phrases in the English language. It, <laughs> it, 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 it's so bizarre and has absolutely yep. nothing to do with the meaning of it. <laughs> like, I don't even... Wait, yeah. Do you know the etymology of, of the phrase? I assume it's like a fish that's very difficult to catch or something. Or, I don't know, maybe, you know, you see a red herring and you're like, that's a beautiful fish, I'm going to go after it. But I have no idea. I think, like, many sayings, you know, it's made up by someone and it may not have much sense to it, but, you know, it takes on a meaning we all understand. A good shorthand for, you know, something that misleads and distracts. Yeah. Huh. Well, I did look up the origin. I had to look up another word because I don't know what it means. Um, but uh, let's see here. It's actually is makes a lot of sense the way it's OK. So it was popularized in 1807 by English polemicist William Cobet. And a polemicist is a person who engages in controversial debate. Um, and so William Cobet told a story of having used a strong smelling smoked fish to divert and distract hounds from chasing a rabbit. So mm. it doesn't sound like the phrase has anything to do with detective fiction. So it's kind of funny <laughs> that it's brought into there. It's such a great use of it, though, because that's exactly what detective fiction does. You know, it's like, here's this very obvious clue. And now you're going to be thinking about that. Meanwhile, here's something else going on in the background you're not noticing. You know, it's mm -hmm. magic 101. It's misdirection. So, yeah, exactly what he's doing, you know, you're diverting the hounds. Um, is We're the hounds in this case. We're reading a story. We're looking for that rabbit. We think we're there. And then all of a sudden, boom, here's some piece of evidence we think that really clears it all up that we were looking for, you know, but really it's it's to divert us. So, yeah, it's a really creative word for it. I mean, one of the best sort of tropes and well-known tropes of detective fiction, you know, and mm -hmm. Sleep Off today, you might be setting up several of them here. Basically, Absolutely. everybody we hear from could be a red herring once we find out who did it because um, they mostly all have some motives and uh, there's some stuff we're learning about that might be red herrings, like the politics stuff, the tugs, those could be the red herrings, you know. Um, it's very open at this point without knowing who did it. So, And that way it's really creative, you know. It's not too obvious who it was six chapters in or such, you know. Uh, yeah. It's very fun. Yeah, absolutely. So how would you complete the mystery? Would you go Man, with with the, the one that you think it is, or like how like how would you? Have I think the so. I think I'd have it be Harriet. I think I'd have it be Harriet. I mean, she's I think an original character um, for the story, same as Val. I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, so I mean, it would make sense, you know, that this person who's trying to come in in the elections. You know, they realize she's trying to get that sympathy vote. That she's wearing tugs, which is very coincidental. Um, 
And then they sort of bust her for that, and she's not able to sort of get the re-election, you know? And there might even be other stuff, you know, if she's going for re-election, maybe she had some scandal that she was covering up, and the wedgie was, like, somehow to, you know, distract from that, or, you know, put all the focus on that. There's some other scandal she's covering up, you know? And maybe her campaign manager could even be a part of it, you know? And Heather, and we get some twist reveals there and stuff like that. So I'd probably do that. I'd probably go kind of crazy. And, and the challenge is, of course, yeah, where are the hints? And you got to leave them out. Um, probably have Val, you know, get better as a detective as we go and find out more stuff. Um, I probably don't want, you know, the typical... Oh, I dropped a penny. Oh, that reveals everything. You know, that little coincidental one random thing. Um, Oh, I'm looking at this ice in my glass and that reminds me of exactly the one thing I need to know. It's like, no, that's, I don't love that. I don't don't love it. I want good detective work. You know, I want good interviews and I'm solving it through, you know, figuring stuff out and getting some truth and investigation, you know. So, yeah, I would uh, keep it along the lines of Sleep All of Today and probably keep it with that kind of reveal of of harriet probably also heather maybe mm-hmm. hmm. yeah that's interesting um how so how would you i guess is is there a way that you can think of that would make sense to like at this moment like what we have is can you think of a way to that would make sense to um sort of position the reveal of who actually did it yeah because now you're asking me to, like write the story live kind of, thing. <laughs> <laughs> kind of impossible to do obviously right. but i mean like i just said you'd have to try and leave some kind of hints right i mean you would have val figuring out some stuff about the campaign probably getting some evidence and documents um that she hadn't had before potentially um maybe heather tries to stop her and heather you know reveals some stuff and then she confronts harriet and kind of learns the truth that way you know she could talk to her um could you know you could go super dramatic you know which is probably not where this story was going but have a kind of rooftop showdown in the in the blizzard where harriet's like i'm gonna stop you from revealing it was me you know or something and uh, no one will believe you or something because you're a mm-hmm. stupid detective. Like, you could have the whole showdown where after it's revealed, you get the truth, you know? Stuff like that. I mean, it's just a matter of leaving out some clues in terms of probably some evidence that comes up more than we have. You know, Valerie putting together some pieces. If someone mentions Tugs again or she thinks about Tugs or, you know, she talks to uh, Harriet again and Harriet reveals some stuff and lets it slip, you know? Or right. she talks to Heather, and Heather starts to crack up under the pressure of all the lies, you know? Stuff like that. If, if you know, Harry had threatened her, said you'd lose your job if you told anybody about X, you know? Um, so that kind of thing. More more interviews, good questions, you know? I think that's how you start breaking it down. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I I honestly wouldn't really mind a sort of low stakes reveal as long as it's done mm-hmm. cleverly because like i think yeah. of like probably the the greatest reveal i've ever seen and one of the best to ever happen is hank finding out about walter's uh, true nature like his pick and finding out about heisenberg yeah. it, Walter, great example uh, that's it it's such a it's it's such a tiny slip up and like yeah it's not this grand reveal this giant showdown of like the the, this giant slip up or whatever it's just this tiny little mistake and that it's It's true that is so realistic to real life because yeah it's great the huge criminals aren't caught in grandiose ways they're just they make these tiny little mistakes that add up to detectives figuring it out yeah, and obviously there, the the wild thing is Hank, you know, he's so, like, precise in building investigations earlier around people like Gus, you know, he mm-hmm. goes to his plant, 
and he the fat like the the laundry and he, he goes on like a board and he talks to electricians and they tell him that's way too much power you know so mm-hmm. he does all this heavy duty work and then yeah walt is he's on the toilet on the mm-hmm. toilet and he just goes to read the book and it clicks you yeah. know so like you could certainly do something with this you know like she could be talking to harriet and harriet could let something slip about yeah oh yeah i never wear tugs but uh this is like it was a one-time thing it's like whoa why would she say that right like, that's kind of like coincidental you know something little like that or or she could see a receipt for tugs that's like really recent you know uh she knows she was wearing them and it's like oh why she wear that or something and, you know little little tiny thing like that you could certainly do and uh in terms of keeping it low stakes you could do like an agatha christie kind of reveal where you just say okay all the suspects gather together and I'm going to tell you who it is and how I figured it out. And then the cops are going to take them away. You know, very civilized, uh, very clean like that. So yeah. that's a, one way to do it, very comedically. And maybe because it's a wedgie story, you know, whoever did it ends up getting a wedgie, you know. And they get taken <laughs> away by a wedgie, you know. And you keep it light, you keep it fun. And it can certainly be that little slip up, you know. It could certainly be someone like Harriet even, or somebody, Heather, being like, yeah, Harriet always said... A wedgie would be great for her poles, you know. It would really help her rise in the poles, you know. <laughs> and then that clicks. And she goes, oh, wow. like that. Uh, And, then, you know, so any any number of things like that could be how it falls into place, you know. Yeah. Now, if we were going for, like, the crazy, insane twist, the the true culprit would be Val. <laughs> yes, that would be great. I love when it's the detective. Always a kind of crazy twist. Yeah. You be Val, or you do, you know, Agatha Christie, and it, it was all of them, all the suspects ganged up on Harriet <laughs> together, you know. So it's that. Yeah, or they all played a part. Like those it. super unexpected, exactly right. They all played a part. They all helped. They all had a reason to do it, you know. So it could be that kind of thing, you, you know. Like there's those outlandish, unexpected ones. Now, like if you read it, if you if it was all of them, I'd be reading that. I'd be like, man, that's Agatha Christie. Like I'd be a little sad, but. If it's done creatively, you know, if it's a, if it's fun and how they all play a part and it makes sense, you probably you you know you let it go and you enjoy it. Right. Yeah. I I think I might have thought of the best way to do the to keep it low stakes and keep it sort of in the vein of Edge and you make it so that nobody is actually the culprit and it was all coincidence. Yeah. Like it no like. Maybe Harriet uh, slipped on something and like she got her underwear caught exactly. on something and like on a coat rack and there was a sweatshirt on there um, and then perfect. she's just me- misremembering. Like, yeah, ooh. perfect. That... I think that's great. That would be a great twist. She does all this investigation, you know, and she goes back to the crime scene and realizes like that must have been what happened, you know. Like that's a f- super fun twist. That's super edgy and love it. I think that's great. Yeah. Wow. Well, if uh, if you ever listen to this sleep all today, well, there's your ending. So you don't have to put you any work <laughs> except actually writing yeah. it. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Uh, which of them? Which of the characters is your favorite? Them. Oh wow, that's a fun question too. Um, I like Becky. We get to see a lot of Becky throughout the year, so I think that's partly why I like her so much. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Val has a lot of potential though. I'll probably say Val. I mean, I'd love to see more of her, learn more about her as a character. But someone, you know, who's investigating, who's trying, I like to see that, you know. And she feels, in a way, kind of minor compared to the other characters we see who, you know, even when they're introduced and the way they act, it's like they're kind of stealing the show in Mm -hmm. every episode. And Val's kind of the butt of the joke in some cases, you know. So I kind of like Val yeah. for that, that she kind of takes a step back, you know. And kind of lets them talk and lets them be themselves, you know. And I think that's a mark of a good detective and a kind of subtle subtle element of the story. So I'll probably say Val. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this is basically an ensemble cast. So Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, you kind of... It's nice that she say, takes a step back. Um, but uh, Yeah. Yeah, I I think if you don't have the prior knowledge and experience of reading these uh, these other characters before, 
I think Val is probably my favorite because you get the most about her in this. You don't need to read anything else. It's not like the MCU where you're like you need to watch all of the movies and all the TV shows to fully understand what's happening. <laughs> like Val is she's given them she we see the most we we understand the most about her because we see her the most of all of them. And yeah. Like, it, almost all the other characters are like they're in it for the interview and then we're on to the next one. Totally. Totally. And the thing I'm not even sure about years later, like if this is Valerie Crow, who is an established uh, character in Edge and has been around since like 2015 as a cop. And like, if that's the same Valerie, it probably is. And I just never really noticed and it clicked. But, um, was she ever described as a detective before? I mean, she's a cop. I don't know how many promotions she gets. Yeah. And where she's at at like, cause this is like five years later we get Wedgie Noir. So she might be the same. Her name is Valerie. I don't know. Could be a totally different character. Could be Valerie Crow, who does exist. But I mean, the way she's played out, you know, it's, it doesn't feel like, as, as you're saying, like she's a character who has a super deep backstory. If you think that's fair to say, maybe it doesn't feel like she's someone who, when you read this, you're missing something or, or yeah. am I wrong? Do you think? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, it's, I don't really know much. Of, I don't really know anything about like before she showed up at the casino, but yeah, it doesn't feel necessary mm-hmm. because like, for a number of reasons, really. But like, I mean, the low stakes, the fact that it's an edge and where like it, things are pretty inconsequential generally. Yeah. Um, there, yeah, I, I think it's it's not something that really needs crazy backstory. Sure. So now on to the Witcher segment. Um, which one of these? Which one of them do you think it is? Well, yeah, I kind of <laughs> want to say idealistic because wedgies are everywhere, right? And everything's about him, and you know, even the way the case starts, and she's in this wedgie, and you know, and and no one minds, you know, talking about them, and no one gets a lawyer. It's very idealistic when you want to talk about wedgies with hot women, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, yeah, I feel like there's maybe a, a more middle ground answer, but it feels like for that, you know, how crazy the wedgies are, how perfect the crime is i guess maybe in some ways too For us, and that there's at least. so many suspects yeah so many wedgie girls who are potential suspects for this yeah. you know and that valerie gets to be like in the middle of all this uh i think it's probably idealistic it really is like the dream yeah i, th- I think it's part of the dream but um yeah, yeah um I, just as a quick thing, I love how you like every single time I ask I ask the question. You're always like, "Wow!" Like you always sound like you're so amazed, like blown away by the question, even though you've heard it a million times before. <laughs> that's, that's great. I love that little thing. But yeah, I I agree. I think it is idealistic. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have Edgen being openly referenced as the setting, where as you said, and as I think most people know in the community, it's it's a wedgie heavy place like that's that is the currency Mm. that's the that's the daily goings on uh but i think there's also the ideal of the police actually handing out handling a case like this and that a case like this would actually happen and so in a similar vein to teacher student bonding by magnipoles i'm wondering about the details of the precinct like how how busy it is how like uh, yeah, how like I really I'm just f- very curious about these police. Uh, what's how, what do you call them? Police, these police forces. Um, yeah, sure. I, it's something of like I don't know. I keep like getting super interested in the the governmental workings of these these universes and stories. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah, and you can go deep into that with Edgen. I mean, they have a police force. One of the cops is very perverted and that's her whole thing. And then we have Valerie Crow, 
gets a lot of wedgies. Mm-hmm. Um, and they usually are just dealing with wedgie related crimes mostly and coming in and trying to help people out of wedgies or often getting them themselves when they're trying to stop them. Right. You know, so like Edgen's a case where you can look at some of that. But the fun thing with Edgen too is you could create a character, you know, who's mayor of this town and have them dealing with the wedgies, right? And you could go further than that, right? And it could go sort of limitless in terms of exploring the government, you know, mechanics of a place that is so wedgy heavy and how that, you know, permeates the culture. Be a kind of fun story to have like a historian, you know, exploring the town and learning about how wedgies came to be there, right? And your historian character can meet some people, do interviews and get a ton of wedgies, you know? Uh, and that could be very fun. Feels like a fun Rook of Spades kind of story. Some yeah. Ways too. yeah like, but Edgen lends itself to all that crazy comedy, definitely. Right. Yeah, like, what are, what are the, like, their history school books contain? Like, yeah, what's it, what's exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's just so many wedgies, yeah. yeah. Well, I, that that was perfect. Coming in right at an hour now. This, that's fantastic. Is there is there anything else that you'd like to discuss about this episode? No, I think it's great we get to chat about an old story like Wedgie Noir and get to talk about noir and mysteries and underdone but gray genre within the community as most genres are, as we noted. Uh, Super excited to hopefully see more mysteries. Uh, Maybe finally I'll get the motivation to write one myself, especially if I can somehow manage to keep it short and exciting and still twisty and revealing. And I mean, that's kind of what you know, Lure of the Night is meant to be. Much darker, probably. You know, inspired by uh, Wedgie Noir by Sleep All of Today and sort of a few Wedgie mysteries we've seen along the way. Just a darker take on it in some ways. More inspired by, you know, noir films and things. For sure. Yeah, I mean, if I'm if I'm thinking of this in terms of, like, steak, this is, like, steak done this. This is, like, the blue of genres <laughs> it's like the one of the most underdone genres um so yeah is there anything that you like to promote from yourself or others uh yeah i've been spawning a lot of new writers coming up but i guess one i want to promote just quickly who has gotten a lot of love but i've been trying to promote for some years is rt blackwood i think a really yeah. cool writer um really kind of unnoticed but slowly gaining a sort of audience not the most prolific recently but um i hope people kind of agree the stuff they put out when they do has been pretty good and it's been pretty popular overall and and that's that's been slow goings i know like anime panties did a podcast episode on him which was really wonderful i know it meant the world to rt blackwood so it's gonna say look for new artists go check out rt blackwood those writers you know are chugging away they don't get the same you know spotlight as some of us other ones right. um and really just leave some comments and faves on people's work you know it can go a long way of course yep yeah yeah all that is it's very important to do yeah our, uh, there's actually just as a quick thing to no, no, I'm thinking. Nope, I keep mixing them up. Never mind. I'm not gonna. Nope, nope. Uh, well, thank you, Hans, so much for coming on. Thanks for having me back, my friend. Of course, always love having you on. And if there's anything that you'd like to hear me discuss, or if you'd like to come on for an episode, leave a comment or send me a message on DeviantArt or Lucky Fetish's new Fatora. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next episode of the Best Book Club.